in the United States. Today, that number has grown to more than 150. I received my training in Rome. The church says the best way to learn how to be an exorcist is through the apprenticeship model to work on receipts and exorcists. Because there were so few here in the United States, my bishop sent me to Rome. The three months that I lived there, I had the opportunity to sit in on 40 exorcisms that the priest training me performed and then to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and who were seeking the help of the church. I've also attended the Vatican Course on Exorcism. It's held every year in Rome, right after Easter. I'm a member of the International Association of Exorcists. It was founded by the former Chief Exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriel Hayworth, and that group meets every other year in Rome for ongoing training and formation, and also as a way of collegiality. Because I am publicly known, and when my bishop appointed me, he told me that he was not opposed if I wanted to be public as a way to help educate people about what the church actually believes about the reality of evil and the ministry of exorcism. Prior to COVID-19, I was receiving around 2,000 emails and calls and letters a year from people all over the United States and even other parts of the world who were seeking the help of the church. Since COVID-19, I now receive 3,500 inquiries from people who believe they are dealing with the demonic. As an exorcist, my primary role is to help lead people out of the darkness of the devil and to help bring them into the light of Christ. How do people fall into darkness? Many people today live with a distorted view of freedom that evidence the fall of humanity mentioned in the book of Genesis. The guiding principles of this distorted view of freedom are this. You may do whatever you wish. No one has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. This viewpoint leaves no room for God, and the end result is a greater presence of evil, both in the world and in the lives of individuals. St. John Paul II has said that freedom in the true sense of the word means to be obedient to God. When we live in the manner that God created us to live, that's what it means to truly be free. We get a distorted view of freedom when we start to believe that freedom means we can do whatever we want. John Paul II would go on to say that when we have that distorted view of freedom, we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. Pope Emeritus Benedict put it this way, when the existence of God is denied, freedom is not enhanced, but is deprived of its basis, and thus becomes distorted. The devil's purpose is to dismantle religion and civilization. He wants to pull us away from God, and he desires our ruin. My favorite definition of the church is that the church is the guardian to the tree of life. It's the vehicle that Christ has given to us to help us enter into paradise and to be in the presence of God the Father. The devil believes that if he can destroy the church, then humanity will be permanently trapped in sin, as are he and the other fallen angels. It's always important when talking about exorcism to define what the word means. Most people have some idea based on a definition that has been shaped by modern culture. Anybody here seen the movie The Exorcist? Anybody planning to watch it later tonight? <laughs> Anybody need to get a night light when you get home? So whether it's the movie The Exorcist, whether it's the movie The Right, I even saw a trailer for a new movie that starts tonight they call, that's called Pray to the Devil. P-R-E-Y. Pray to the devil. People are fascinated by various programs on TV, paranormal activity, ghost hunting, reading books on magic and casting spells, and the use of the internet. The problem with all of these things is that they create a fascination with the devil, but in the ministry of exorcism, the 
fascination is always on the power of God. Now the word exorcism comes from the Greek word exorcismos, and it's a term that signifies an insistent request manifested before God or directed against demons. To exercise literally means to bind with an oath. And it's very core in exorcism of the prayer. It's a prayer that brings healing and relief to those afflicted by the evil one, allowing that person to be reconciled to God. When God is being requested to expel a demon, we call that a supplicating or a minor exorcism. Prayers of deliverance would fall into that category. When the demon or some other evil spirit is being addressed, we call that an imperative or a major exorcism. Again, supplicating, directed to God, a major exorcism, a command given to the demon. Now, Catholic belief holds that anyone may say a supplicating exorcism prayer on behalf of someone else. Again, it's a prayer directed to God, and we know that anyone can pray to God on behalf of someone else. However, an imperative exorcism, as an official right of the Catholic Church, is reserved to the priest who's been authorized to do this ministry by his bishop. So the official right of the Church is this red book. You cannot get it at Amazon or any other bookstore. The only way to get a copy is through the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and only a bishop can ask for a copy of the book. The new right of exorcism came out and was promulgated by St. John Paul II in 1998. It was released in 1999. It was tweaked again in 2004 and 2005. The English translation came out in 2016. This replaced the right that had dated back to the year 1614. So from 1614, until 1998, the right virtually remained unchanged. What's new about the right? It contains supplicating exorcism prayers. Again, prayers directed to God. And the purpose of the new right was to place the pastoral care of all those who believed that they were up against the attacks of the devil in the hands of every parish priest. Demonic activity is classified as extraordinary or ordinary. There are four different types of extraordinary demonic activity. Demonic infestation, demonic vexation, demonic obsession, and demonic possession. So demonic infestation has to do with the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. Something that was created specifically to create a connection between an individual and a demon. Think, for example, a Ouija board, a voodoo dog, things created to cause a connection between a person and a demon. The interesting thing about infestation is that demons don't live in a location. They don't have an address like you and I do. Because as pure spirits, St. Thomas Aquinas would say, they're not contained by space. The space is containing us. St. Thomas Aquinas would say that demons as spirits are not contained by space. They contain the space. So if there's a manifestation of evil in a location, it literally means that evil is acting there because people have done something to attract the attention of the demons. So demons don't live in the abandoned hospital or the prison. It's the very things that people are doing there that are causing the demons to manifest. Demonic vexation, physical attacks. People receive marks and bites and bruises and even incisions of letters that appear on the body for a period of time and then subside. Demonic obsession or mental attacks. The devil is literally trying to get inside of someone's head. Perhaps they constantly hear noises in the house, footsteps. Maybe they hear things like the rattling of chains. Again, they see shadows and dark figures. They might become really obsessed with the number 666. Again, the 
devil is trying to get into a person's head so that everything they experience is filtered through the reality of the devil. And then we have demonic possession, whereby the devil or one of his demons will take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own, using the person's mouth to speak, their eyes to see, and their ears to hear. Whenever a demon possesses a human body, it's always important to make a distinction between that person as an individual and the demon who's now using that body as if it were its own. Why would the devil want to possess a human body? And the answer lies at the very core of our Christian faith. The devil wants to mimic God. What's the greatest thing that God has done for us? The Incarnation. God has taken on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. And the devil, in his own twisted sense, believes that he takes on human form when he possesses a human body. But when he does that, because the human person is created in the image and likeness of God, he wants to distort the human person. That's why the manifestations that we see are meant to scare and terrify. Some of the things that I look for is someone might be possessed, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual, having elevated perception, knowledge about things that that person as an individual would not otherwise know, and then for an aversion to anything of a sacred nature such as being in a church, a chapel, having the Bible read in front of them, being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, having a relic placed on their head as the prayer is being said. Some of the manifestations that occur, bodily contortions, a change in the voice, whereby it will become much deeper and authoritative because the demon wants to convince everyone that it is the one who is in control. There can be a change in physical appearance, such as foaming at the mouth, the eyes rolled in the back of the head, unpleasant odors, a change in the temperature of the room whereby it becomes much colder, laughing and uncontrollable hysteria, hissing and the resemblance of the movement of a snake. During exorcisms, when a demon is manifested, I witness a person's body drop to the floor and begin to slither across the floor just like a snake. Even in Rome, one of the exorcisms that I set in on, I saw a levitation. So I'm standing about four feet away from this lady who's with her husband, and all of a sudden the demon manifests. There's this hideous look and grin on the face that the demon is now projecting, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at this and I see the person's body begin to rise out of the chair. I'm looking at this and thinking, what in the world has my bishop gotten me in? <laughs> the priest came in, go. It was a very, very teachable moment. He was praying right. He glanced out the corner of his eye. He saw the levitation. He went back, continued to pray. He looked over again, never stopped praying. And then in one moment, he took his hand, put it on the head of the person, and pushed them back down into the chair. Not once did he flinch or ever stop the prayer of the church. Basically saying, really? That's all you can do? I'm not impressed. <laughs> so I've learned over the years not to focus on the theatrics of the devil, but to always stay focused on the power of God. Now, all of these can be indications of demonic possession, but before proceeding with the right of the church, there is a protocol that is followed here in the United States. In many ways, I'm trained to be a skeptic. I should be the last person to believe that someone is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. The church says that I need to reach moral certitude, meaning beyond doubt, the person in front of me is truly possessed. So the protocol, step number one, to have a psychiatric evaluation. And it isn't necessarily that the church doesn't believe the person, but if the person is truly possessed, they will have to get to a strong mental state 
before employing the rite of exorcism itself. Step number two would be to have a physical examination by a medical doctor. So the church is asking experts in the mental health field and in the medical field to weigh in on the matter, basically answering the question, is there something about this person's condition that is outside of your scope, your training, or your understanding? I do not ask the doctor or the psychiatrist if they think a person is possessed. I will make that determination, but I want the best possible information that I can get, so I rely on these experts. Step three of the protocol would be to do an intake questionnaire. If it's truly demonic, I need to determine what was the entry point for the demonic into this person's life. Knowing that entry point allows me to know which doorway needs to be closed so that the person doesn't continue to invite, invite that evil into their life. Step four of the protocol is the most important, to normalize the spiritual life of the person. It's not enough to cast the demon out. God has to be invited in. Chapter 11 of Luke's Gospel gives us the account that when the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders to the air and wasteland, and then coming back and finding the house swept clean, it goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come and take up residence in the person so that that person's condition is worse than it was before. Being swept clean means the demon is gone, but God has not been invited in. There's been a growing trend in recent years because faith is in decline. The people who are dealing with the demonic are beginning to view the Catholic priest as a magician. They think that I have special powers or abilities, or I have tricks up my sleeve that I can use to make the demonic go away. If people are relying on me, we are all in trouble. But if we are relying on the power and the authority of Christ that he has given to the church and to his ministers, that's the right mentality to have. Even the priest who trained me before I left Rome, he cautioned me and said, if you're ever doing an exorcism, and even think for a split moment, look at what I'm doing. He said, you just walked on the holy ground. Because in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He is the main actor. And priests can get themselves into trouble if they start to believe that somehow it's all about them and not all about God. The extraordinary activity of the devil. Now I want to talk about the ordinary activity of the devil. You know, head spinning, pace and flying can gain anyone's attention, but all of us do need to be aware of how the devil tries to trip us up in the ordinary circumstances of our daily lives. When it comes to the ordinary activity of the devil, I believe that he uses a four-stage plan of attack on all of us. Begins with deception, which leads to division, which leads to diversion, which leads to discouragement. So on our daily journeys, we all encounter someone or something who is intelligent, concealed, powerful, destructive, and who wants to intrude into our lives in ways that are harmful and destructive. It is worth our while to pay attention to these attacks for their primary goal is to fracture our lives in such a way that we are pulled further and further away from God. And the further we are removed from God, the more we lose our sense of identity. The human person has been created in the image and likeness of God and has the innate desire for God. St. Augustine said it best when he said, You have created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. The devil uses his ordinary activity to try and drive a person away from God, whereby they become more isolated and more susceptible in believing the lies the devil is presenting to them. And ultimately, the devil wants his lies to become the truth in the mind of the human person. So, deception. 
the devil inverts reality. He turns things inside out and upside down. He wants to pull us off track and then present, then proceeds to present his lie as the truth. What does he say to Eve in the garden? You will not die. You will become like God. When the devil speaks, he speaks according to his nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All of these deceitful promises have to do with the future. Gratitude looks to the past. Love looks to the present. But fear always looks to the future. We want to be in control, and we want to know the outcome. No one knows the future but God alone. But the devil is very intelligent. He can use deductive reasoning to guess what we might be thinking, how we might act, and then he can use that against us. The end result of deception is that the devil has misled someone, and they now find themselves in the midst of scandal and depression. What did Adam and Eve do once they had sinned? Did they turn to God and say, Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa? No. When God called out to Adam, where are you? How does Adam respond? What have you done? That woman you put here, he pointed the finger at her. Eve, what have you done? She pointed the finger at the serpent. The devil cannot impose. He can only propose. We have free will, and the devil is trying to get us to use our free will to turn away from God. The only thing that God does not have from us that he desires is our free will. The goal of Christian life is to unite our will with the will of God. When the angels were created, God gave the angels that opportunity as well, basically saying to the angels, I've created you, I've given you this great intellect, and with all the knowledge I've given you, will you now use that knowledge and turn to me? And what did Lucifer do? He chose to turn away from God, and when he did so, he influenced one third of the angelic choir to join his rebellion. The book of Revelation tells us that his chaos swept one third of the stars out of the sky. And what does the devil want us to do? He also wants us to turn our backs on God and to go our own way. When we do that, it leads to division. So division. We should not be surprised that the devil directs his energy to division and disunity. He desires to divide people from God, from each other, and from their very selves. The devil works against our redemption in Jesus Christ, which reconciles us to God and allows us to share the unity of the Holy Trinity. Do you know what the word redemption means? We hear that word a lot. It might even be a religious buzzword, so to speak. But the word redemption literally means to buy back. And when Jesus died on the cross, what was he doing? He was buying us back from the devil. And when had we been so out to the devil? There in the garden, with the sin of Adam and Eve, original sin. When we choose to embrace Christ and follow him, we enjoy that great gift of redemption. The devil, however, would want us to collapse with him into eternal death and everlasting alienation from God. He does this by drawing us into a world of deceit and untruth, whereby we become broken. On the night before he died, Jesus prayed. This is in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, may they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may become completely one. The devil's attempts at dividing us represent the counterpoint 
to Jesus' triumphal work of healing, reconciling, and unifying. The devil wants to stymie us, to halt us, and even paralyze us on life's journey of bringing a sense of unity to our existence. He can make us feel overwhelmed so that we will give up. He stirs up fears to make us frightened so that we will withdraw. He can suggest that we compare ourselves to others so that we will bad in comparison. He sets us up against each other with the likes of anger, resentment, contempt, greed, and impatience. He can short-circuit our lives with things like drugs and various forms of addictions or infidelity. Think of the opioid crisis, alcohol abuse, addiction to pornography, the breakup of the family, abortion, euthanasia, and the list goes on and on and on. The Gospel tells us that we will find our life when we give it back to God who gave it to us. In Mark's Gospel we read, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the Gospel will find it. Mark 8.35 But in order to give our lives to God, we must have something to give. That is, with a unity, an integrity, and a coherence about them. In other words, we need to have our lives in our hands so that we can give them over to God. But the devil doesn't want us to bring the pieces together. If we remain fractured and broken, we cannot surrender ourselves to God. This brokenness leads us to the third stage of attack of the ordinary activity of the devil, namely diversion. So again, deception. We bought into the lies of the devil. Where did that lead us? Division. We are broken. And where does that lead us? Diversion. The devil desires that we divert ourselves from the pathway of God. He moved the people of Israel, who were on a journey to the Promised Land, away from the worship of the one true God, to the worship of false gods. They worshipped a golden calf, a calf, and adopted the pagan practices of the nations around them. We call this idolatry, and it's a weapon the devil still uses today, substituting a product of our own creation for the uncreated God. And sometimes the devil will try us to give in to things like materialism, give in to pleasure, give in to knowledge, whereby we say, I learned so much that I don't need God because I become the source of my own knowledge. The devil's goal in diversion is to have us lose our focus and our sense of purpose and direction. Diversion acts in a very subtle way. Oftentimes we have been lost off the path of God for a while, and we haven't even realized it. After we have followed the ordinary activity of the devil through deception, to division, to diversion, we arrive at discouragement. It is a loss of hope, meaning, and purpose. I believe there are more people discouraged today than there are people who are depressed. Discouragement is the most dangerous threat to the spiritual life. It's evident in the tiredness that marks so many people today. If you ask somebody today, how are you? What's the number one response? I'm tired. I'm busy. It manifests itself on the joyless faces of people that we see in supermarkets, in restaurants, walking down the street, even sitting in the pews on Sunday. In Dante's Divine Comedy, there's a sign above hell that reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter. These words ring true for all those who have been swept into the deep and dark hole of discouragement. Discouragement leads people to stop trying, to pull back, to do something else, or even just to come to a halt. These things are of such great interest to the devil because he knows that they can derail us on our journey to God. In the Christian tradition, we call discouragement acedia. It comes from the Greek word akadeo. And what does it mean? I don't 
care. Have you ever heard someone echo that sentiment? I just don't care. The speech of Senia speaks to things like melancholy, sloth, laziness, especially in regards to religious obligations and practices. It can be the result of things like tiredness, feeling overwhelmed, intimidated, and experiencing personal disappointment. When people have journeyed through the stages of the ordinary activity of the devil, I believe that they arrive at a crossroads. We've gone from deception to division to diversion to discouragement. Now we have a choice to make. One pathway leads to death. Always spiritual. People completely give up on God and now claim to be an atheist. Sometimes it's physical death. Think of the growing trend of suicide in our society today. But we are Christians, we are people of hope. The other pathway leads to discipleship. It means that we wake up. Think again of the ringing of the church bells. We recognize that God must have his rightful place in our lives, and ultimately, only in relationship with God will give us the meaning, the purpose, and the direction that we long for. So how do people fall into the extraordinary and ordinary activity of the devil? The Bible presents us with specific instructions on how to get victory over the devil. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, as a roaring lion, prowls about seeking one to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. In James 4.7, we are told, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In Ephesians, St. Paul says, Do not give the devil a football. The truth is that far too many people today are giving the devil a football. They're not being sober and vigilant in their faith, and they're certainly not resisting him. I always like to say to people, if there is more demonic activity in the world today, it's not that the devil is up to his game, it's because people are more willing to play the devil's game. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier. Faith in God leads us in one direction, and the lack of faith leads us in another. And we are living in an age when faith is in decline. I saw a recent study the other day that suggested that 79% of Catholics between the ages of 18 and 35 now no longer believe in God. They've completely rejected the belief in God, and some now believe that they can go on in life just fine without him. So how do people play the devil's game? In the 17 years I've done this ministry, I want to share with you the eight main ways that I have seen where people open up an entry point to the devil. Now, demonic possession is real. It does happen. But perhaps only one out of every 5,000 cases is a true case of demonic possession. Most of the other cases have to do with vexation, the physical attacks, obsession, the mental attacks, and infestation, the presence of evil in a location or with an object. So number one would be ties to the occult. The word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, and it means hidden or secret. It focuses on knowledge of the paranormal. Its basic root is that a people want a glimpse into the future. And why do people look, want to look into the future? Because of fear. What does the devil instill in all of us? Fear itself. It's associated with things like palm reading, going to see a medium, the use of the Ouija board, tarot cards, going to see a psychic, using a pendulum, a crystal, practicing magic. All magic is inherently evil. And I don't mean the illusionist that makes something disappear, but magic in the true sense of the word, where someone wishes to cause harm to another with the help of the devil. Other things would be horoscopes, the practice of witchcraft, and I'm going to throw out knocking on wood. 
Anybody here ever knock on wood, by the way? You're thinking there's no way I'm raising my hand right now. <laughs> the good news is, just because you've ever knocked on wood, I don't think you're possessed. But I use that as an example of how things of an occult nature can become so mainstream, mainstream and common that we do these things without really understanding where they come from. The practice of knocking on wood is a druid practice. It's the belief that spirits live in trees. And knocking on the wood is a way of trying to awaken the spirit to come to your aid and to grant your wish. It's kind of the notion of the genie in the bottle. You know, in the Islamic tradition, demons are called jinns. J-I-N-N-S. Guess what English word we get from the word jinn? Genie. A genie in the bottle. So again, I use that as an example of how things of an occult nature can become mainstream that we do things that we do not fully understand. Now, all of these things are condemned because they're a violation of the first commandment. What is the first commandment? God says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. When people turn to the world of the occult, they're forgetting about God and going to someone else they believe can give them what they want. But what's the main power behind the world of the occult? None other than the devil himself. In the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 18, verses 10 through 12, it says you must never practice black magic, be a fortune teller, a witch, cast spells, ask ghosts or spirits for help, or consult the dead. Whoever does these things is disgusting, in the eyes of the Lord. Leviticus 19.31 Do not defile yourselves by turning to mediums or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. People need to realize we can never use the power of evil for our own benefit. The devil will ultimately always use us and his ultimate goal is to destroy us. Even if people turn to the world of the occult and at first it seems as if they're receiving a benefit, eventually the bottom will fall out and people's lives will begin to unravel. The second entry point is the entertainment industry. Halloween is how many days away? <laughs> Driving in this evening, I noticed that there's some goblins, goblins, I think, at the town park this evening. Again, we have a great fascination with evil. So the entertainment industry, Halloween, movies, TV shows, literature, games, computer and IT gadgets. All of these create a fascination with the devil and make him appear as this great heroic figure. The danger with the entertainment world is that the devil can play on a person's memory and imagination. And if we put all this demonic stuff inside of us, then the devil can use that as a way to instill fear and to cause us to feel as if we are under attack. The third entry point is being cursed, the opposite of a blessing, doing harm to another with the help of the devil. A few years ago, I did an exorcism in the state of Alaska at the request of the Bishop of Fairbanks. As an exorcist, I could not function outside of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis without the permission of my bishop and the bishop of the other diocese. Remember, the bishop is the exorcist, and so I act in the name of the Archbishop of Indianapolis. For me to function outside, I need permission. The bishop of Fairbanks asked me to do an exorcism on a young lady that he had already assessed was possessed, but he said he really didn't have a priest to do that, and so he asked me to do it for him. I was training the new exorcist in Anchorage, we flew 300 miles west of Anchorage, landed in a small Yupik Eskimo village of 500 people. The family came up the river two hours by boat. The name of the town, it is always, I will always remember the name of the town, Antioch, Alaska. In the Yupik Eskimo language, guess what the word Antioch means? The place where it comes out. Now, it was a reference to a river, but in the world of exorcism, 
I didn't know what it is to play on words. This young lady that was possessed, she came with her sister, brother-in-law, and her grandmother. The grandmother said that it was her parents who were involved in the occult. Her mother was the witch in their village. Her grandfather was the shaman, the witch doctor, and they had caused a demonic entity to attach itself to the family line. And then it finally reached this young lady. We went into the church to begin to do the exorcism. There was a nun there from Philadelphia who was in charge of the parish. The Diocese of Fairbanks, by the way, is bigger than the state of Texas, California, and Montana combined. And there's 19 priests in that geographic area. So this particular church only has mass every other month when a priest is able to fly in. Otherwise, they have a communion service. This nun was in charge of the parish. I don't think she believed in any of this, by the way. But by the time I left, she said, please bless me, bless the church, bless my heart. <laughs> bless everything that is in now and We went into the church. The demon manifested, exhibiting superhuman strength. It took everyone else to hold the demon down. The demon is flashing, thrashing on the floor. The demon only spoke once during the exorcism. When I held up the crucifix, the demon looked at me and laughed and said, Your God is dead. Now this priest I'm training, he about hit the roof when this happened. It was about 50 degrees outside. It was raining. The wall radiators in the small church came on, and the whole building began to shake as the exorcism was taking place. When that happened, the sister of this lady was so terrified, she ran out of the church to get away. I told the priest that I was training. You stay and continue to pray. I'm going to go check on her. I go out there. She's literally shaking. And she says to me, I can't go back in there. She said, when I ran out and I looked back, I saw demons all around you in that church. And she said, there is no way that I can be back in that environment. The devil was really doing exactly what he wanted to do with her to get her to give in to fear. But as long as we remain strong in our faith, the devil is nothing to be afraid of. So again, this young lady had been cursed. A fourth entry point is being dedicated to a demon. So it's, there was a young man at a uh, Jabal school for boys, operated by the Knights of Columbus, south of Terre Haute, Indiana. This young man, 17, was put into that facility for assaulting a police officer. His pastor of his parish said that he believed this young man was possessed. So when I went to visit him with his pastor, this young man told me, he said, ever since I declared Satan to be my father and dedicated my life to him, I found such a power and a strength that I've never known before. And it's so, and then he's like, it's so exhilarating and addictive that I would never give that up. And then his pastor says to him, may we pray for you? He says, well, you can pray if you want, but I don't really care. Exorcisms cannot be performed on someone against their will. We all have free will. We have to have the desire to be set free. This priest began saying a beautiful prayer. As an exorcist, you're trained, never take your eyes off the person who is believed to be possessed. This priest is praying, his eyes are closed, beautiful prayer. I'm watching this young man, his eyes are closed, they begin to move a mile a minute inside of his head, his back begins to arch, a low growl starts to come out of him, and I say, Amen. Because that was not the time or the place for him to truly manifest and to be able to do an exorcism. When he got out of that facility a few months later, he came to see me, but basically, he did not really want any help. He wanted to maintain the relationship with the devil that he said that he had made. Certainly, we pray for someone to have a change of heart, but again, exorcism cannot be performed on someone against their will. The fifth entry point is abuse, which can create emotional wounds that can cause a person to seek help from the wrong source. 
When people are abused, they can feel broken and fractured. They can even blame God for what has happened. Here's an example. As an exorcist, I hear some pretty horrific stories. There was a lady of 50 years of age, been away from the church for many, many years. A friend of hers was trying to get her to come back to church. The local priest went to visit them, and he said that when he was there, he believed the woman began to manifest. He asked the lady if she would like some help. She said yes. So I agreed to meet with her, her friend, and the other priest. We're in a room having a conversation, and she tells me the story that at the age of seven, growing up in Mexico, her father began to rape her at the age of seven, and it continued over the next five years. At the age of 12, her father turned his attention to her younger sister. Again, she was shattered and broken and said that she blamed God for allowing that to happen. As a young lady, she turned to curanderos, to witch doctors and brujas, witches, who said that they could help with the pieces of her life back together. But she said she only got broken even more. She's looking at me, telling me the story. She's sobbing uncontrollably. And then she says to me, will you help me? And I looked at her and said, Jesus is the one who's going to help you. And as soon as I said that, the demon manifested. The person's eyeballs turned green. The pupils became slanted like a serpent. And his voice came out of the mouth and said, Who's he? He has no power over us. Now her friend sitting next to her literally leaped over the table to get away. This other young priest with me, he fell to his knees and began to rattle off hell mirrors like a machine gun. <laughs> I got up immediately, went right over to this person, laid my hands on the head. These green eyeballs are staring back at me, cussing me out, blaspheming God, growling, laughing, snarling. I reach into my pocket and pull out holy water, and I bless the person. And when the drops of water hit the forehead, there was a shriek and a scream and a whimper, and the body collapsed to the floor. This was not the time to do an official exorcism. I have to prepare myself, celebrate Mass, go to confession, spend time in prayer, fast, determine who else will be present. There's no such thing as exorcism tourism. No one is there out of a sense of curiosity, and you would not want to be there, and you know why? When a demon manifests, it sizes up everybody in the room, and guess who the demon will go after? The one perceived to be the weakest link, either trying to instill fear, even trying to lunge at the person. And then I will determine where the exorcism will take place, always in a sacred space. I jokingly say it's never done in an abandoned house at midnight during a thunderstorm. <laughs> the devil doesn't get to choose where he's defeated. The devil himself, the devil, the church herself will make that determination. So a week later, we're in a chapel. We all came back, myself, the afflicted person, her friend, the young priest came back. We're in the chapel. The rite begins. All the elements of the rite of exorcism are meant to force the demon to manifest. Demons would prefer to remain hidden, but when they're dragged out into the light, so to speak, is when the battle against them begins. Always begins by blessing with holy water, reminding ourselves of our baptism into Christ, by which we have put on Christ and have become a new creation. The litany of the saints, invoking our Blessed Mother and the saints of the Church to come and be present in this prayer, the reading of the Psalms, gospel accounts of Jesus casting out demons, and then the insufflation prayer. So the rite began. I bless the person with water. The green eyes are back again. The demon looks at me and goes, You can't get rid of us. We've been here too long. You're not strong enough. I continue with the rite. I get to the insufflation prayer, the breathing on the face of the person invoking the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. 
He recalls when Jesus breathed on the face of his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I simply went, Receive the Holy Spirit. The person sitting in the chair, the demon manifesting, the chair flew back 10 feet, hit the wall. This lady comes flying up out of the chair. There's a shriek and a scream. She collapses on the floor. Myself and the other priests lift her up, and she's praising and glorifying God. And there's a glow about her. The best way to describe the glow is the halo that we see above the head of the saint. They are not radiating their glory. They are radiating the glory of God. And that glow is something that I always look for, to know that the demon has truly been cast out. Because sometimes they will give the false impression that they have been cast out so that the priest will stop the right of the church and simply move on. Number six is a life of habitual sin. It's no longer following the divine will, but following our own will. We live in an age where people are losing the sense of sin. It goes back to those three things I said earlier. You may do as you wish. No one has the right to command you. You are the God of yourself. I was ordained a priest back on June the 1st of 1991, so I'm in my 31st year. Now, oftentimes people will say to me, Father, I don't know why I go to confession, because I always find myself confessing the same thing. If I'm going to say the same thing, why do I bother to come? And my response is, the fact that you can still call that sin a sin is something good. You may have not won the battle yet, but you're still in the fight. The greater sin would be to say, I'm always going to do that, so why confess it? That's getting into the sin, rather than staying into the, in the fight. Number seven would be involved in cultivating a relationship with a demon or inviting a demon into your life. An elderly man in Indianapolis, he wasn't Catholic. Half the people I talk to are Catholic. The other half are Christians from other faith traditions, other world religions, or no faith background whatsoever. So this man had no faith. His family were members of a Christian church. He was getting advanced in years, and they were concerned what would happen to him when he died, because they said that throughout his life, he had always cultivated relationships with demons. So I went to see him. I'm talking to this man, and he says to me, I know my family is concerned about me, but they need not be. He told me, when I die, it's my desire to spend eternity in hell with Satan and these other demons that have become my friends. Demons cannot be your friend. They don't want to be your friend. They may give that false impression, but their ultimate goal, again, is to destroy us. The family hears this man say this, and they're like, what can we do? What can we do? And I said we have to pray that he has a change of heart. As long as we have a breath in our body, there's still a chance. Think of the good thief on the cross. What does Jesus say to him? He says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't even ask for salvation. But because Jesus sees that his heart is in the right place, he responds by saying, this day you will be with me in paradise. So even if someone has an attachment to evil, we should always pray that they leave that world. The final entry point is broken relationships. We all deal with brokenness in our lives, but how we deal with it does seem to matter. Do we give in to anger, bitterness, and resentment, or do we always seek forgiveness? Does it mean it will be easy? Does it mean it won't come without pain or effort? But ultimately, the Christian is called to seek forgiveness and to forgive those who hurt us. The best example comes out of the Gospels itself. Chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, the story of the Gerasene demoniac, the man possessed by legion, living in the tombs. Feathers won't even hold him, superhuman strength. The legion, the demons, see Jesus. How do they respond? You know, when someone's possessed, 
It's rarely the case of just one demon. It's always multiple demons. The act in clusters. And there's always a demon of a higher ranking. The demons say to Jesus, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come against us before the appointed time? Notice how they go from the singular to the plural. Again, the indication that demons act in clusters. Jesus rebukes the demons, orders them to come out. They ask to be sent into the swine. Jesus sends them into the swine. You know, they're pleading for mercy, so to speak. But once in the swine, they show their true character because they destroy the swine by racing over the hillside where the swine drown in the lake. Most people usually stop reading that story, but the most important thing happens next. The man who was possessed by Legion now wants to follow Jesus, and Jesus says to him, no. How often does Jesus tell someone not to follow him? Like, never. So it's a very teachable moment. Jesus says to him, no, go home to your family. Jesus takes a man who is living amongst the dead in the tombs, and places him back amongst the living in a healthy relationship with his family. And in the world of exorcism, it is believed that it was the brokenness in this man's life that eventually brought on the demonic possession. Possessed by legion. How many is a legion, by the way? How many is a legion? 3,000. 3,000. So, the final thing I'll share with you are best practices. So these following practices should be observed by anyone who is experiencing either extraordinary or ordinary attacks of the devil. And most importantly, maintain fidelity to God. Discontinue practices that are inconsistent with our Christian faith. Be patient and exercise humility. Have confidence in the Holy Spirit. Remember what I just said. Wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. Take the initiative. Intensify certain spiritual practices, such as regularly attend Mass and receive Holy Communion. Seek out a regular confessor for the sacrament of penance. Spend time in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. Incorporate Marian devotions into your daily prayer routine, especially the Rosary. Our Blessed Mother is probably the most powerful ally for anyone who believes they're up against demonic attacks. And why is that the case? She destroys the attacks of the devil by her humility and obedience to God. She basically reverses the attitudes of Adam and Eve, who gave in to pride, and who also gave in to disobedience. So when God says to Adam and Eve, this is what I'm telling you, what was their response? No. When the archangel Gabriel appears to Mary in the Annunciation and says, this is God's plan for you, what does she say? Yes, let it be done to me according to your word. Each and every time we say yes to God, being obedient to God, we destroy what the devil is trying to do to us. And we all know that we need help, so call upon our Blessed Mother. Use scripture for prayer and reflection. St. Jerome says, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. If we don't know the word of God, then how can we defeat the devil? When Jesus was being tempted in the desert at, at the beginning of his public ministry, how does he defeat the temptations of the devil? He talks back using the Word of God. So when we know the Word of God, we can talk back to the devil and defeat his attacks against us. We should use sacramentals such as holy water, blessed salt, blessed objects, sacred images, a crucifix, a St. Benedict medal, for example. Include other devotions, divine mercy, prayers to patron saints, do no venus, resist, fight back. Do not give in to the lies of the devil that you have been abandoned by God or feel nothing of God. Fear God and not the devil. 
Matthew 10, 28. When confronted firmly and decisively, the devil is weak and helpless. He's essentially a coward. I like to say the devil is a cockroach. Where, where do cockroaches like to be? In the darkness. And if you flip a light on, what do they do? They scurry to every crack and crevice they can find. In an exorcism, the church is throwing the light of Jesus Christ on the devil and his demons. And when that happens, they will always scurry away and flee. Anytime we're being attacked by the devil, we can also take what he's doing against us and use that to our advantage. What do I mean by that? Whenever an enemy is attacking, where do they attack? At the perceived weakness in a person's defenses. So if you believe you're being attacked by the devil, then he's attacking what he perceives to be a weakness in your life. You now know what you need to shore up in your spiritual life as a way to defeat the devil. So again, anytime the devil is attacking us, we can take what he's doing to us and use it to our advantage to grow in holiness and virtue. And finally, the devil does not possess any particular strength. If we are willing to resist him, we will see that his power was never more than a facade, and it will quickly crumble before us. Demons have power. They can only be defeated by power. The power that defeats them is the power of God, and the ministry of exorcism is one of the ways that we call upon the power of God to defeat the devil and his demons. Father Vincent Lambert, thank you so much. That was an incredible talk. Vision, deception, and the uh, diversion. It seems like that goes on in our society every day, and you know it does happen. That, and that's the most common way the devil attacks us. So, actually, we've got another treat for you guys tonight, too. We're going to do a question and answer session. So, if you didn't hear what you wanted to ask, this is your time to ask that question. And we appreciate all good questions. I've uh, gotten a chance to hear them before back at St. Catherine's, so thank you, Father Dury, wherever you are. Um, and it, the Q&A was just amazing. I loved the insights that it brought up. So please do feel open to doing so. Also, what we're going to do is we're going to pass a free will basket around. If you've enjoyed tonight, this helps to pay off for any incidental expenses, but it also goes to uh, Father Vincent's ministry as well, so that he can help spread the word and Expose Satan for who he is. All right, so um, with that, would anybody like to start the Q&A? Yeah, I'd like to start with
Freemasonry. What's the danger with Freemasonry? Is that it's believed that they incorporate elements from pre-Christian faith. You look at mythology, for example, and the question would be, some of these deities that come out of ancient human history, are they nothing more than demons that have been worshipped and eventually were viewed as deities? So when the church looks at Freemasonry, the church highly cautions against that because it's believed as a secret society and people may not fully understand what they're getting themselves into. It could create some type of demonic attachment. John Paul II is a very powerful ally in the ministry of exorcism. Every exorcist will tell you that there are certain saints that seem to be really powerful in combating the devil. In my own ministry, I've seen St. John Paul II, St. Jenna Galgani, St. Rita of Kasha, St. Catherine of Siena, Blessed Bartolo Longo, which most people have never even heard of him. Blessed Bartolo Longo, who is he? He was a devout Catholic living at the end of the 19th century. As a young man, he went off to the University of Naples in Italy. In college, he fell away from God, gave in to atheism. Does it sound familiar in today's society? Gave up on God, eventually entered the satanic world, where he became a satanic high priest. His family never gave up on him, continued to pray that he would have a change of heart, and he did. He left the world of Satan and returned to the Catholic Church, and then dedicated his life to ministering to college students, encouraging them to maintain their relationship with God on the college campus. So think about that for a moment. A man who was a former satanic high priest is now on the road to sainthood in the Catholic Church. Again, it's the recognition that no one has ever completely lost to God who wants to be found. If you've ever traveled to Italy, if you've been in Naples, people always go to Pompeii. There's a great church in the city of Pompeii, Our Lady of Pompeii. Guess who built that church? Blessed Bartolo Longo. He attributed the intercession of the Blessed Mother for getting him out of the satanic world and back into the church. And so he had that church constructed as a way to give honor to our Blessed Mother. Another powerful uh, saintly figure is Father Canino Amantini. He's a servant of God, a passionless priest. He did exorcisms at the Holy Stairs in Rome right across the street from the Basilica of St. John Lateran. It was Father Canino Valentini who trained Father Gabriel Hainworth and also trained Father Carmen de Philippus, who trained me. So Father Canino Valentini would do exorcisms every day. It was his full-time ministry. If you've ever been to Rome at the Holy Stairs, people will crawl up these stairs, believed to be the ones that Jesus walked on as he was being condemned to death there in the palace of uh, Pontius Pilate. And what happens? They're moved to Rome. But at the top of the stairs, in the back, there's a chapel. That's where the exorcisms were performed. Can you imagine crawling up these stairs? And as you're crawling up as a sign of piety, hearing shouts and screams from the possessed coming from that chapel, it would probably make you want to move a little bit more quickly
I mentioned that we should rid ourselves of anything in our lives that is contrary to the Christian faith. Yoga. Most people begin doing it for the exercise. So again, it begins by seeing being something that seemed to be good and harmless. The danger is the spirituality that's associated with yoga. All the yoga poses are believed to be poses to different deities within Hindu religion. And so when people are striking a pose one way or the other, it's a way to honor and glorify certain deities within Hinduism. Now most people don't know that, but again, there's the importance of knowing and understanding what it is we're doing. Even the word yoga means to yoke. The goal of the Christian life is to yoke ourselves to Christ. When something is yoked together, they operate as one. We need to make sure that we're yoking ourselves to Christ and not to something else, especially if that something else is nothing more than evil. We have another question. Father, I have a couple, actually. Um, my mom always taught us when we were young about the occasions. Um, how do our, in our um, culture right now, we have so many addictions. How do those addiction, addictions play into opening to occasions. And the second question is, I also have been a psych nurse for many, many years, and you talked about the um, trauma from abuse, and I know that on two different occasions I actually worked with women who had what they now call dissociative disorder, disorder, what we used to call multiple personalities. And as you were talking, I was thinking, wow, you know, it's that broken, fractured, complete personality, you know, that splinters, and what your thought is on that. So, the near occasion of sin. Again, that's where the devil proposes. Usually most of our sins are rooted in what we call the seven deadly sins. So the devil is trying to give up, get us to give in to some passion or desire. How does the devil tempt Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry? After 40 days of being in the desert and fasting, the devil appears and says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to turn to bread. In other words, you're hungry, you've been fasting. Give in to the sin of gluttony by turning these stones into bread. So again, he always tries to trip us up when perhaps he knows that we are weak. And when you look at addictive behavior today, probably one of the ones that's so rampant in society today is pornography. And what does pornography do? It reduces the human person to nothing more than a mere object for one's own sexual gratification. What sin is that? The sin of lust. So when you look at the seven deadly sins, there are virtues that go along with them. Rather than giving in to gluttony, we have temperance. Rather than giving in to lust, we have chastity. So we have ways to counterbalance that. And temptation is never a sin. It's what we do with it that determines whether or not it becomes a sin. Jesus was tempted, but he overcame it. When we are tempted, we can overcome it too if we rely on the power of God. When it comes to mental health issues, demonic obsession is probably the most difficult of the four types of extraordinary demonic activity to deal with. Obsession is more difficult than possession, because obsession you're trying to really pull apart what's mental, what's spiritual. That's why the input of a psychiatrist or psychologist is so important. The former exorcist of Indianapolis Monsignor John Ryan, he passed away in 2005. That's how I got his job. He was the parish priest where I went to grade school. You know, the Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a stably appointed exorcist. Even when it fell out of practice in many dioceses after the Second Vatican Council, Indianapolis always had a priest assigned to this ministry. When the bishop appointed me, 
He said he wanted to continue that continuity. He even admitted that he wasn't sure what he was asking me to do. But again, it's the notion it's important to have a priest in that role. But where I went to grade school, right across the street was a mental hospital. Monsignor Ryan used to go over and visit some of the residents. He would take communion. And he told me that he would go in to take communion. There would be residents by the front of the door. When he would walk in, they would begin to curse at him and to spit at him. And then he would go and make his rounds. And as he was leaving, these same residents would say, Have a good day, Father. Thanks for coming in. It's sure good to see you again. Why the change in behavior? He believed that some of these people were possessed. And the demons were reacting to the presence of the Blessed Sacrament that he had on his person. So sometimes, is it always mental health? Is it spiritual? It's really hard to pull that apart. That's why it's so important for the priest, the psychiatrist, to really get together and to come to a good decision on what is this person dealing with in their life. What do you suggest to start a deliverance ministry with modern To start a deliverance ministry, the most important thing would be to have the support of the local bishop, your parish priest, because again, if one is going to confront any type of demonic demons, demonic activity, it's important to know that you're operating with the church and the power and the authority to go with the church. Sometimes people are well-intentioned. They believe that someone's afflicted by a demon and they begin to pray over them. I had someone who came to see me and said that they were, they were afflicted. A group of people began to pray over him. A demon manifested, and what did the people do? They were terrified and they ran out the door. So the worst thing you can do is to actually cause a demon to manifest during a deliverance session and then run away in fear. So people involved in a deliverance ministry have the support of your bishop, your pastor, should be someone who's really connected with the sacramental life of the church, going to confession on a regular basis, people who have a spiritual director. So again, you have to make sure that you're truly taking care of yourself so that you can be on firm and solid ground. Because if someone begins to attack the devil, guess what the devil will do to you? He will attack him as well. Because the devil knows who's working to defeat him, and he will attack those involved in deliverance and even exorcism ministry itself. Do other religions recognize demonic possession? And if so, do they have a form of exorcism? The Catholic Church does not have a monopoly on the practice of exorcism. But I will say that it's probably done more within the Catholic tradition than in others. The Orthodox tradition does have exorcisms. I had an Orthodox deacon I talked to who said that they have the right, but nobody was authorized to use it. Other Christian faith traditions, being like Protestant churches, evangelical churches, they also have a form of exorcism. In the Catholic Church, it's a liturgical right. Because it's a liturgical right, we have a prescribed way for it to be done. A lot of other faith traditions, it's really less ritualized. It's simply praying for someone. But again, it's a liturgical rite, so it's become ritualized in the Catholic Church. The Church does recognize, again, that people can be delivered, even in these other faith traditions, because ultimately it is Christ himself who is doing it. Even some of the great saints of the Church were able to do exorcisms. St. Catherine of Siena, she never used a ritual book. She would simply walk down the street, and because she was radiating the glory of God so much, demons would see her and they would shriek and flee. So again, the notion of holiness and virtue really goes a long way. And that's really a key ingredient in anyone involved in combating demons. You cannot combat demons if you are in a state of sin. Satan cannot be divided. He cannot be cast out if someone is in a state of sin. That's why it's important for me to go to confession. The Catholic Church says 
that sacraments are always efficacious, regardless of the charism of the priest. Maybe the priest is a bad guy, but if he does a wedding, they're still married. If he does a baptism, still baptized, celebrates mass, and still the body and blood of Christ. But that's not true in an exorcism. If a priest is in a state of sin, the devil does not have to pay any attention. We had a priest come into the Archdiocese of Indianapolis to do an exorcism without the permission of the Archbishop. He was doing the exorcism in southern Indiana. The demon manifested, and guess what the demon said to him? Who are you? Who are you? We recognize the authority of the local bishop, but who are you? You have no authority here. We don't have to pay any attention to what you said. He realized he had made an error. He stopped, sought permission of the archbishop, who said, well, you've been working with that person. You can continue, but then he told me to be involved as well. So again, demons are very authoritative, and they also don't have to respond if we are being disobedient or in a state of sin. Thank you, Father. We have another question. I have two. Um, if you suspect that there is generational problems, is it possible for individuals to pray their own deliverance prayers to rid themselves, or do you need the help of the church? That's one. And the other is, what do you do in the event that you have adults in your home who are bringing things in like um, pyramids and uh, cone shaped things that come to a point and you know that they're coming from metaphysical stores that sell tarot cards and witch supplies? What do you do about that? Because there's going to be a big problem to try to If people are bringing things in your home and you don't want them there, then it's time to have a good family talk and discussion. You can't control what other people do. Again, we all have free will. But if you don't want those things in your home, then set up rules that people need to respect and obey. You know, just as much as they want you to respect what they're doing, if it's your home, then they should respect you while they're under your roof. When it comes to generational sin, people can say spiritual warfare prayers on, on their own behalf. Even in the rite of exorcism, the new rite, there are prayers in here that people can pray on their own. So there are prayers in here that a person can pray on behalf of themselves, and there's also prayers in here that people can pray on the behalf of someone else. When it comes to generational sin, one would simply have to say, I hereby declare no and void any pacts or agreements with the devil that have been made by any family members within my line. I hereby declare these no and avoid. You know, I invoke the sacred heart of Jesus. So there are great prayers that are out there. I always say to people, though, and this is my own personal opinion, spiritual warfare prayers don't need to become a part of our daily prayer routine. To me, they're like a prescription. We take it for a set period of time. But for me, it's the ordinary aspects of our faith where we should really put our time and attention. Going to Mass, the sacrament of life of the Church, praying and reading the Bible. The danger with doing warfare prayers all the time is that they can cause us to focus more on the activity of the devil rather than on the power of God and what he wants to do in our life. So again, for me, spiritual warfare prayers like a 10-day prescription. You do it, but then you go back to the ordinary aspects of our faith. Uh, do we have any religious or priests here who would like to ask a question? Okay, then I'm going to take something from over on this side because I haven't really been over here. Because, I mean, evil is a reality, it's around us, but again, the power of God is greater. 
the sacrament, the sacraments, sacramentals that we use are a good way to remind ourselves of the presence of God. So blessing from with holy water, very powerful thing to do. St. Catherine of Siena was a very big believer in the use of holy water. Um, I'm curious, why does the, when you're doing an exorcism, why not like record that and make those supernatural things in the public and to bring people to like, hey, look, this is real, the devil's out there, bring people closer to the church and help them turn their eyes because of all these things. An exorcism is kind of like going to confession. It's considered to be a private matter. The church would not want to publicize someone who's being afflicted by the evil one. If that person decides to go public on their own, that's certainly up to them. But the church would always want to protect and safeguard the identity of the person going through this right of the church. The other reality is that demons can impact technology. So even if people are using these instruments to record, the demons can do things with those instruments as a way to disrupt and kind of corrupt what is being presented there. Hi, Father. Um, I've heard that Enneagram is connected somehow to the demonic. It's a very popular like personality test. The Enneagram, yes. Yeah. Can you talk yeah, about Yeah, I think that? it comes out of me, the Mideastern tradition. It was very popular when I was in the seminary. Back in the 1980s, all seminarians had to go through an Enneagram test. So it even tells you how sometimes those things can find their way into mainstream, even within seminary systems. I don't believe they're done anymore. But again, I think the danger with the Enneagram thing is it's trying to you know, put a label on people and peg you in a certain way, rather than just recognizing we're all children. Hi, Father. Thanks for being here. Um, have you ever had any experiences where you've, um, you've notably seen the power of God in a very profound way? And then, secondly, are there any times you've been afraid? What was the second part of it? Have you ever been afraid?
If you stop praying, I'll stop screaming. But if you keep praying, I'm going to keep screaming. People will hear the screams. They're going to come in here and see what you're doing. And then you're going to have to stop anyway. So just stop now. And I looked at the demon and said, I command you to obey me in all things, although an unworthy minister of Christ, to say the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, in the order I commanded you to say them and to leave immediately. And this demon that had been speaking in this very deep, authoritative voice looked at me and in a child's voice and with a whimper said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And then there was a shriek and a scream, and this woman began to glow. In the gospel accounts of demons being cast out, there was always some type of shriek or scream. Father, we have I was to now with that person for one year. And if you've heard me speak before, people were like, well, what did you do since it was finally over? And that's when I said I was hot, I was drenched in sweat, tired, exhausted. This had gone on for about two hours. I was two hours away from my parish, and so I stopped to Dairy Queen and had a chocolate shake on the way home. <laughs> it was very refreshing. I walked into Dairy Queen and it was packed, and I thought to myself, if these people knew where I just came from, I would be like Moses partying in the Red Sea to get right up to the front of the counter. Father, we have time for two questions left. Uh, I'm going to have a question here, and then for anyone who is under 18, I would like you to think of a question, and we'll finish on that. Hello, Father. Um, so I have a question off of this, this topic I've heard amongst different conversations that people have talked to about, like, number synchronicities. I don't know if you've heard of this. Like, if you see on a clock, like, a number 222 or 333, it means something good, or something is good bound to happen. I've heard the term angel numbers. I don't know what the church's teaching is on that, or if you've heard of that before. I have heard of that. It's a growing trend today where people believe there are hidden messages behind certain numbers or sequences of numbers. Now, there are some examples of that even in the Bible. The mark of the beast is what number? 666. We talk about the seven days of creation. Seven is considered to be a perfect number. Why is it the perfect number? It represents all there is. The three persons of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the four elements of creation, earth, wind, fire, and water. So there is some elements of truth to that. The church would say we should be very cautious in trying to see hidden messages within numbers, though, because that's a way that the devil can be trying to lure us in. So even though numbers can have some significant meaning, especially in Scripture, we shouldn't start to see numbers everywhere with hidden messages. To me, that would eventually go into a form of demonic obsession where we have this mental attack, that we see these numbers and somehow we start believing that we're receiving secret messages. And even though we may think they're coming from a good source, like an angel, remember what I said earlier, St. Paul, 2 Corinthians, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and he deceives many people. And I think the whole use of numbers can be a way that the devil is trying to deceive us. So, um, would you say it would be wise to skip Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not the candy. <laughs> you know, to me, if we're going to celebrate Halloween, we have to ask the question, are we glorifying evil? Are we glorifying evil? For some churches that on Halloween, you know, they'll have some type of a party at the parish, but the kids will dress up as a saint. So again, they try to put a positive spin on the celebration. So rather than honoring and glorifying demons and whatnot, to me there is a way to put a positive spin on it. Here's another example. Sometimes people always ask me when I get to talk, what about Harry Potter? What about Harry Potter? If you tell kids not to read the books or watch the movies, guess what they're going to do? They're going to read the book and watch the movies. 
my question, sometimes I like to respond to, with, to a question with another question. So when someone asks, are Harry Potter books bad? This is my question. Which book do your children know better? The Bible or Harry Potter? Which one can they quote the most? And the answer to that question will tell you that perhaps it's not a good thing. If children know their faith well enough, if they read that book, perhaps they can filter what they're reading through their Catholic faith and see what's wrong in these books, glamorizing evil, presenting evil as something good, casting spells and, and whatnot as something good. But again, if children know their faith well enough, then perhaps they're able to counterbalance these things and see how these things are inconsistent with our faith. If they can see that, maybe they can generate a conversation with their own friends. Because young people tend to listen to other young people. They look at me and say, well, you're old, so you're obviously going to say these things. But if someone of their own age group says something, I think that that speaks more powerfully to them. So I think there's a positive way to celebrate Halloween, and there's a positive way to address literature and movies and things. But again, which book do your children know that the Bible or Harry Potter? And if they know Harry Potter better, then there's some need for some catechism to begin to take place. Thank you, Father. This has been an absolutely amazing year. safe driving tonight. Father Lambert has to go all the way back to Indianapolis, so we are going to allow him to go out without any further questions. We're just going to try and get him on the road so that he makes it home in one piece and gets to do more of these amazing talks. Thank you, guys. Good to have a sense.